I've changed the title a bit. I feel a little bit like a striped dog in this environment. You know, in Germany we say that, a striped dog, somebody who's a bit strange. Because I have been hearing, and very rightly so, is some criticism, a lot about the necessity to think about transformation of agriculture, to think about peasantry, and so on and so forth. But my work, or our work, is a big pro project, is um, predominantly about industrial workers, but we have also looked at agriculture, industrial workers, and um, workers in the service sector. We have done a five-year project in these different countries that you can see here. Um, looking at the life histories of environmentally engaged trade unionists in different countries of the world, in Sweden, in the UK, in Spain, in Brazil, in India, and in South Africa. So why do we do that? One of the reasons is quantitative, although we have a qualitative approach that is, actually if you look at the um, workers in the world, 28% are in agriculture, but 23% are also in industrial, and 48.8% are in the service sector. So of course, numbers don't say anything, uh, everything, sorry, <laughs> don't say everything, but it is important to look at the way in which workers in all these different sectors can actually become agents of environmental change. Because the idea that is behind our research now going on for many years is that without the active uh, participation of workers in all the areas, we will not be able to transform societies into socialist ecological societies, to say it as a shorthand. So we need to know how the workers think about nature, future, the relationship between labor and nature, in order to find perhaps a way to connect to the way in which people think and act um, where they are. So it's great to have a good vision and a broad vision and a perspective, but it is important to see how can we connect those perspectives to the way in which people think. And the way uh, the people we have been looking at are, of course, already a specific kind of elite, quote, 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 because they are trade unionists that have important roles in the trade unions in all these different countries in the world and are responsible for the environmental policies of their trade unions. So the first part is labor and nature. The quotes are a bit longer, but I'm only going to read the red part, so because I have to be fast, fast, fast. <coughs> so the first thing uh, we have defined, or I have defined as the container model of the relationship between labor and nature, is a trade unionist from India who is saying, whether it is the big dam or the small dam, I was, if you wanted to say, in the past, on the wrong side, so in favor of all these big dams. We are. But then he says, now it's different because that is a no, no, new trade union in India, the new trade union initiative, which is the only big union who has environmental policies, actually. But he says, we are protecting the environment for whom? For the next generation. Are we going to leave the next generation hungry? So then we have people with low mental capacities because their parents were starved and have a wonderful environment. <coughs> we're talking copy here. So this is a image of there is labor and then the environment is something around it, has nothing to do with labor itself, it's uh, mutually exclusive. Either you do what for labor, something for labor or you do something for the environment. But there is also the image of nature as labor's other. For instance, as a trade unionist in Sweden says, where came the, the interest for nature? It came from a general interest in nature a romantic perspective from a not us perspective, so a little bit of similarity. Uh, oops. So it is this pristine nature over there where you go in order to restore yourself, whereas in the workplace there is no nature whatsoever, is the idea that is totally uh, alienated from nature. Then there is environmental work as an add-on to all the work that a trade unionist has to do. The world has become so much more complicated, and the issues that the trade union movement is expected to tackle, it's a huge range of issues, and then you add to it environmental issues, and it's really hard. 
because everybody's already got so much on their plate, so you have kind of a list of things that you have to work through as a trade unionist. And then on top of everything is the environment. So it's not connected at all to all the other issues that you have to deal with. But you have also the, the concept or the image of nature as a mediator for survival. This is a trade unionist in the construction workers union in India. Construction workers in India in that area are predominantly women. And she says, when we were working, kind of things cropped up. Drinking water, waterways, all these issues were brought up in the 80s to 90s. And then we combined the slum issues with the fishers. That was a very important experience, which kind of helped me to understand the fisher people's issues, which are very much connected to ecological issues. So this is a perspective that is possible because this trade union doesn't deal only with workers as workers, but also with workers as citizens living in the slums and the needs that they have. So out of this work kind of necessarily comes another view of nature, not as something over there or as a container of other things, but as something that is necessary for the survival of people. So it's a mediator of labor and of survival. Finally, we also have a religious model. This is uh, Kut, is the main um, national trade union in Brazil, the one that Lula came from. Mm. And this trade unionist says, then my friendship with Leonardo Boff and with Marina Silva and the study of ecology led me to think that there was something supreme, subtle. The Bible says all creation has to be redeemed with the presence of God on earth. In other words, it's all a relationship between man and nature. Stupid. So, and this is a, a, a perception that we find quite a lot. I'm not finished already, am I? Oh, no, no, no. Okay, I'm no, not. Um, so you find that a lot in Brazil, and I think this is the result of the uh, theory of liberation, which was very influenced in the workers' movement. So I'm going to be quicker now. Then you have the, the image of the Human Nature Alliance, which comes from the uh, Association of Fishers Workers in India. We need to protect tribals, we need to protect our devices, then we need to protect the forest, otherwise you will not get rain timely will not have sea world. So this is the chain. We need to protect the environment, and we're part of this environment. So this is perhaps the most complementary vision that we could find uh, among unionists or among representatives of workers' organization. And as you can see, it comes from the work that these people are doing. So another way in which we can think, yes, people work in agriculture, not generally, but they have an easier access to thinking <coughs> that humans are actually part of the environment because their survival depends on that view. So uh, a trade unionist from the Metal Workers Union in South Africa says, it's not really the environment, it's capitalism. And so the issue is not really integrated into one perspective and outlook. So this problem dealing with environmental issues is you have a theory about what capitalism is, and the theory uh, of the way in which capitalism deals and exploits workers. But what is the role of nature in that kind of theory? We need to develop a new theory that can integrate this in order to be able to make a policy that is not just an add-on policy like the one that was represented in the image before. And finally, uh, somebody who was active in the Lucas plan many years ago, I don't know you're all too young to remember that, uh, he says, some of us, we were very interested in other cultural views about production in relationship to nature, for example, the North American Indians and Chief Seattle in particular, and the spontaneous speech he made, every part of this country is sacred to my people, and uh, the important thing, the point that I want to make, one way of getting into understanding the relationship between labor and nature in a different way is also to reach out and learn from other ways of living and other cultures when you think that your own way of working kind of alienates you from that view, from that 
So what do we do with all these different views? My main point is, very quickly, that it's important to criticize that. I mean, we, have, we all know the criticism about pristine nature, there's no such thing like that, nature is constructed with humans and all that, critique of religion. But as Marx says, we do not confront the world in a doctrinaire way with a new principle, here is the truth, kneel down before it. We develop new principles for the world out of the world's own principles. So the question would be for some people of us who try to develop theories and perspectives that have something to do with the way in which people think and with their perspective, could we get all these perceptions and views into a, not confrontational, but into a discussion so that all the views can kind of learn from each other and complement each other. So that was just half of the talk. So now I'm in the future. I think I will have to do that very, very quickly. Have I five minutes more? Yeah. Okay, the future. This is Ernst Bloch. It's a question of learning hope. Hope superior to fear is neither passive, like the latter, nor locked into nothingness. The emotion of hope goes out of itself, makes people broad instead of confining them. So that's kind of the point of departure. But the first thing that we find is actually dystopias. So workers that are not only afraid of the future, but think that um, conveying this fear of the future to their workers will be a way of motivating to act. And Bloch says to this, the work against anxiety about life and the machinations of fear is work against its creators who are for the most part easy to identify. So he said that when he was analyzing the sources of fascism in Germany and he was um, arguing that fascism can become uh, powerful because it instigates and creates fear in people. So maybe it's not a good idea for us who want to motivate people to act against environmental degradation and crisis to instill fear in people in order to motivate them. But a lot of trade union policies is about that. So utopias are a lot about incremental steps. Step by step, we're going to get there. There are technological fixes, utopias, if we only do carbon, um, carbon capture, if we have a wonderful hydrogen system. In Sweden, we don't have a problem with just transition because we already have such a fantastic country. I'm going very quickly though. Is this an utopia or a dystopia? <coughs> because what is often not seen in this technological fix is that it's still material that has to be used, has to be extracted and has to be constructed and then destroys landscapes in that way. But there is also the idea that technology can reduce growth, um, efficiency needs to be increased in machinery and then you can reduce um, the production and reduce the resources by still having comfort. So the question would be, it's a big question mark here, can we go from, in, from the idea of incremental process, technological fixes, to technological transformations. Then there are a lot of retropias. I borrowed or stole that concept from Bauman. Normally you say, you say retrograde utopias, you know, thinking that the past is this fantastic place where everything was in harmony, like some trade union, uh, inv uh, not environment, just trade unionists say, the present mode of industrial production is incompatible with nature, the Indian way of living right from very old ages is to live in harmony with nature. The British destroyed all that. But when I asked the same trade unionists, okay, can you think of alternative ways of doing production when you think that in the good old times everything was fantastically harmonious? They say no, there is no alternative because you cannot talk to people about reducing production or reducing consumption because they say to you, we get rid of all these things of poverty and of food shortage, and then only people will be willing to talk about environmental issues. I'm almost done. So there are two ways in which the past can be conceptualized. One is the first one uh, that Bloch describes, past that is graphs in isolation and clung to in this way is a mere commodity category. 
without consciousness of its becoming. But, as Marx then says, it will become evident that it's not a question of drawing a great mental dividing line between past and future, but of realizing the thoughts of the past. Lastly, it will become evident that mankind is not beginning a new world, but is consciously carrying into effect its old world. There is different <coughs> ways of using the past. And then I have the best thing, societal relations, which is thinking about <coughs> changing the way in which not renewables are used, but changing the ownership and also when you, have ch when you change the ownership and when you have the same rights in deciding how production is going to be done, like that was the idea of the Lucas Plan people, then you're able to think not just of incremental steps, but you're able to think about doing something totally different. For instance, not having great, fantastic electric cars, but having no cars whatsoever, and using the skills and the technology that exists in car making to do something better. And this is the end. And uh, I will read this. The question is, how can we connect and revive the stale dreams that exist into living dreams, and how can we liberate the past from being just weighing on us heavily and preventing us from looking into the future and making the past become something alive that can be thought of in the present and that can help us to create a different future. Thank you.